14, the Pittsburgh Steelers, that's the score. There's an armored suit around the corner that we have bought to give to Fran Tarkington tomorrow when he goes out to meet Mean that's Joe Green, right? right? Super Bowl IX arrived on a frigid, rain-soaked January afternoon in the southern city of New Orleans. An early morning storm left the playing field waterlogged. Originally, the Super Bowl was scheduled for the rainproof, air-conditioned comfort of the Louisiana Superdome, but it was unfinished. So the game was moved, replete with gusty winds and gray flannel skies, to ancient Tulane Stadium. The Pittsburgh Steelers and the Minnesota Vikings would meet in the worst weather yet for a Super Bowl setting. But the cutting cold and damp did not deter 81,000 fans, particularly the huge Pittsburgh contingent, for after 42 years, their team was at last competing for football's grandest prize. And at times, the Sugar Bowl sounded more like Pittsburgh's own Three River Stadium. <laughs> We're number one. Our voice is number two. Pittsburgh's opponents, the Minnesota Vikings, had been to the Super Bowl summit not once, but twice. And in the hard history of this game, the team with the most experience has always won. So in the ninth coming of Super Sunday, the battle lines were clearly drawn. The youthful enthusiasm of the Pittsburgh Steelers matched against the Minnesota Vikings' glacial calm. Minnesota iron against Pittsburgh steel. In the first quarter, Pittsburgh's strong running attack twice brought the ball across midfield to set up field goal attempts. But both kicks failed. On the first, Roy Jarella hooked the ball wide. This failure set the tone for the kicking performances of both teams for the entire game. The Steelers' second foray into Minnesota territory was even deeper than their first. From the 16, Pittsburgh went after number 25, first-year cornerback Jackie Wallace. Terry Bradshaw found Frank Lewis free in the end zone, but Wallace quickly recovered to save the touchdown. On the next play, Bobby Walden bobbled the center snap, and the Steeler threat was ended. Pittsburgh had two excellent scoring opportunities in the first quarter, but had no points to show for it. Minnesota's offense, however, fared far worse. Fran Tarkington said, Pittsburgh expects us to run inside, and we will. We just have to get some muscle in front of our runners. But the only muscle Dave Osborne and number 44 Chuck Foreman saw was Steeler muscle as Joe Green and Ernie Holmes jammed the middle tightly closed. After each series, Pittsburgh's defense left the field with glee. In fact, their entire bench was loose and laughing, almost absurdly relaxed. And well it should, for in the first quarter, Minnesota had been limited to just 27 total yards and a single first down. The steel curtain defense had decisively taken command of the game. In the second quarter, Jackie Wallace continued to be challenged by the Steeler offense, but the young cornerback responded with gusto. Wallace had a reputation for mistakes, and Pittsburgh picked him as a pigeon, a target to probe. Terry Bradshaw had tested him short and now tested him long, but Jackie Wallace, among all the well-known names on the Vikings' defense, played the finest game of his brief career. Pittsburgh discovered the presumed weak spot just wasn't there.
However, midway in the second quarter, Bradshaw buggy whipped a pass to John Stallworth, and Wallace was burned for the first and last time today. The 22-yard play was the longest of the game so far, but its real importance was in the field position it gave the Steelers. For the Minnesota defense soon clamped down and forced Pittsburgh to punt. The kick came from inside Minnesota's 50, and it put the Vikings in vulnerable position in the shadow of their own end zone. Thus, the scene was set for the first score of Super Bowl IX. It was fitting that the Steel Curtain defense was responsible for the first score in this game, for all afternoon they manhandled Minnesota's offense. Pittsburgh set a Super Bowl record by bankrupting the Viking running attack. The incredible total was merely 17 yards gained against them. On the scoring play, Dave Osborne never saw the ball, which accidentally was kicked goalward by the golden shoe of L.C. Greenwood. Dwight White's tag on Tarkington in the end zone completed the first safety in Super Bowl history, and Pittsburgh led two to nothing. Now with time and a half short, the Vikings came roaring back on the arm of Fran Tarkington and for the first time today, drove steadily downfield against the Pittsburgh defense. play that symbolized the day for both teams. Glenn Edwards' vicious hit stripped John Gilliam of the ball and gave Mel Blunt an easy interception for Pittsburgh. This was perhaps the most crushing blow of all, for instead of a Viking first down on the five, the Steelers controlled the ball again. Their slender 2-0 lead was preserved at the half. Despite their mistakes and the absolute dominance of Pittsburgh in the first half, the Vikings were only two points down and would receive the second half kickoff. Roy Jarella slipped and squibbed his kick along the rain-soaked polyturf. But Viking veteran Bill Brown, number 30, couldn't handle the wet kick, and Pittsburgh had the biggest break of the game, the ball in great field position on the Minnesota 30-yard line. Behind playbook perfect blocking, Franco Harris went 24 yards before being forced out of bounds. Then as number 72, Jerry Mullins, buried Wally Hilgenberg, Harris swept left and was free. The first touchdown of Super Bowl IX increased the Pittsburgh lead to 9-0. Though he seemed like a Sherman tank in a Steeler suit, Franco Harris was not an army unto himself. He had a lot of help from his friends. Pittsburgh's forward wall dominated the line of scrimmage by completely obliterating Minnesota's legendary Purple Gang. Behind devastating blocking, Franco Harris set a Super Bowl record 158 yards rushing and was named most valuable player of the game. While the Vikings defense was discouraged, the Viking offense was puzzled. 
but they never did solve the riddle of Pittsburgh's two tackles with their looping, stunting stack over sets that terrorized center Mick Tinglehoff and completely eliminated the Viking running game. Forced to pass, Tarkington was like a darting deer among a pack of howling wolves. When he could get a pass over the onrushing lineman, the results, more often than not, were disastrous. In this Super Bowl game, the mantle of greatness vividly passed from Minnesota's purple gang to Pittsburgh's steel curtain defense as a quiet quartet watched helplessly from the sidelines. Pittsburgh's dominance occurred even though they lost two starting linebackers, Andy Russell and Jack Lambert, for much of the game. Despite the loss of Russell and the presence of Dwight White, weakened with pneumonia, Minnesota continued to go directly into the Steelers' strength, where three all-pros were concentrated. Number 59, linebacker Jack Ham. Number 68, L.C. Greenwood and number 75, Joe Green. Still, the Vikings went exclusively to their right, where in a matchup of all pros, Greenwood devastated tackle Ron Yerry, hounded Tarkington into retreat, and like a volleyball player in pads, spiked three of his passes to the ground. Another key was the inability to hit John Gilliam, one of the most dangerous deep threats in the league. Often Gilliam got free, but Tarkington only saw Steelers. On one occasion, L.C. Greenwood batted a pass back to Tarkington, who caught it, then managed to hit Gilliam 40 yards downfield. But the play was whistled dead an illegal second effort, in effect, an embarrassing Talkington to Talkington completion. But four plays later, Minnesota retaliated when rolling right as usual. Talkington managed to loft the ball over Greenwood and Green. The result was a 28-yard completion, the longest of the game for the Vikings. With a rare visit into Pittsburgh territory, Talkington surprised by rolling left for the only time today. But number 78, Dwight White, was waiting. Joe Green made the interception, and the Vikings' brief spurt was over. However, early in the final quarter, Minnesota got another chance when Franco Harris fumbled and Paul Kraus beat him to the ball. Here, Tarkington went for broke, throwing the football as far as he could. It paid off handsomely, for John Gilliam drew an interference call on Steeler safety Mike Wagner. The penalty gave Minnesota its best position of the day, the ball at the Steeler five-yard line. Now with the momentum of the game teetering uncertainly in the Pittsburgh end of the field, the steel curtain clamped down again. Chuck Foreman Jack Knight into the line and lost the ball. Joe Green came up with the trophy, and the Pittsburgh defense had again saved the day. But Pittsburgh's reprieve lasted only four plays. Matt Blair poured untouched into punter Bobby Walden, and Terry Brown had an easy touchdown. Incredibly, Minnesota was back in the game 9-6. to six. But frustration and errors were not over for the Vikings. On the extra point, Fred Cox's kick hit the left upright, and Minnesota remained three points short of a tie. 
holding an uncertain three-point lead, Terry Bradshaw had his finest moment. A quarterback is always in the spotlight, but today Bradshaw had somehow seemed on the periphery of events. Now, with the game up for grabs, the youngster kept a cool many thought he didn't possess. Three times he completed third down passes, the first for 30 yards to Larry Brown on the longest and most controversial play of the game. It appeared Brown had fumbled and that Minnesota had recovered the ball on their own 28. It would have given the Vikings a tremendous boost at a crucial time. But the headlinesman, Ed Marion, overruled the initial decision, and Pittsburgh retained possession. The anguished Vikings protested vigorously, and after the game, many pointed to this call as a cruel turning point in their fortunes. But the official was correct. On the controversial play, Bradshaw spiraled a pass deep in the seam of the zone. Brown soon ran into a crowd, but he lost the ball after he hit the ground. Once Brown's body touched the turf, no fumble was possible. The two officials nearest the play, but behind it, immediately signaled Vikings ball, and the Steelers started off the field. But Ed Marion, a cross field, was the only one with a clear view of the play and he correctly overruled his fellow officials. Pittsburgh had a new life. Now deep in Minnesota territory, the focus returned to Franco Harris and the Steeler running attack. The Purple Gang braced for the onslaught, but Bradshaw crossed them up. On a misdirection play, Harris went left, and the ball in Rocky Blyer went right through a gaping hole. The brilliant call was good for 17 yards and a Steeler first down, but Pittsburgh was soon faced with another third down situation, and Bradshaw again went to number 20, circling out of the backfield. The scrappy Blyer was hit immediately, but stretched for the vital first down. The clock continued to run as Minnesota's chances receded into the evening shadows. From the four, Bradshaw ended the long 66-yard, seven-minute drive by rolling out and drilling the touchdown pass that clinched the game. Terry Bradshaw had given the Steelers an insurmountable 10-point lead over the demoralized Minnesota Vikings. Now, as darkness shrouded the field, the steel curtain forming an eerie tableau stamped indelibly on the memories of all who witnessed their great performance struck one final fatal blow. Mike Wagner's interception of a desperation pass was Pittsburgh's third and all that remained for the beaten Vikings was to watch helplessly as Franco and his friends muscled down the clock. The Steelers' sideline celebration now seemed noisier and more crowded than Bourbon Street had the night before. Right on Dwight? It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of time. 51 seconds, as a matter of fact. Oh, we got to be the one. That's going to be our song now. We got to be the one. We got to be the one in 51 seconds. Bradshaw and the Steeler offense easily ran out the clock. 16, 15. convincing victory over the Vikings, 
Pittsburgh Steelers had boiled 42 years of frustration into 60 minutes of brutally physical football. Their coach, Chuck Noll, got the ride of his life, for the Pittsburgh Steelers were the champions of the National Football League. But on this bitterly cold Louisiana evening, the warmest tribute of all came in the Pittsburgh locker room. The man they called the chief, the Steelers' owner, Art Rooney, received the game ball from his team and the Vince Lombardi trophy from the commissioner. The popular 74-year-old patriarch was a lovable loser no more. After 42 years, Pittsburgh's long wait was over. <laughs>